Hello, good morning, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar, How to Achieve Higher Profits by Optimizing Your Promotional Pricing Strategy. For the agenda today, we'll have a very, very, very brief introduction about the company I represent. Next, we'll talk about promotional pricing, what it is, what it's not, when and why we should use it, and why it often uh, backfires. And finally, I want to use real data from a real project that we did for, uh, for a client of ours uh, to explain at a very high level how to use machine learning to find the optimal price. So sit tight and let's get this rolling. I am Francesco Sguanci and I lead the data science team here at Dana Solutions. We are a digital commerce and business transformation consultancy. We have been in business since 1988 and we are headquartered in Chicago, but we also have operations in Minneapolis and Bangalore, India. Our mission is to deliver velocity to our clients. Now, if you think back to your physics 101, you'll remember that velocity is a combination of speed and direction. So we provide you with direction using our advanced analytics offerings and with speed by helping you automate your business process. Now, our expertise starts with helping you devise or at least consult uh, with the digital uh, your digital commerce platform. Then we can provide direction through our advanced analytics and then speed through marketing automations. And that closes the loop. And we refer to that as the virtuous cycle of customer engagement. So as I promised, that was a very, very brief overview of our company. So now back to today's topic, what is promotional pricing? And sometimes it's called discounting. That's really what we all know it uh, as discounting, right? Um, and why, why should we even do it? So I have my own definition of promotional pricing. I think of it as the unsustainable marketing strategy to achieve very specific short-term goals. And what do I mean by unsustainable? Does it mean that I cannot use it uh, more than once or I cannot use it over the years? Absolutely not. What I mean is that it's best when it's used um, a little bit at the time, uh, once in a while. And we'll talk about this in the next slide. But for now, what, why, do we, why do we need, why do we want to do promotional pricing? What, one reason, and the main reason, is to achieve short-term uh, cash flow. Now, the other one is to remain competitive during special events. Everybody has, well, not everybody, but uh, many people, most companies have Christmas sales, Black Friday events, Cyber Mondays, and you may decide not to have one, but probably you're not going to see a lot of traffic during those days. Uh, you may want to use it to increase your online or offline traffic and build impulse buying. Or if you need to utilize the resources or move the obsolete inventory, that's another way and another reason why you do promotional pricing. And sometimes you can use it to promote a new SKU, a new product, or just for marketing purposes, it can be a form of advertising. And once in a while, it's okay to, um, for your brand equity. Now, that being said, unfortunately, many companies overlook the limitations of discounting or promotional pricing, and they end up losing money in the long run. And here are the, the most common reasons. So the drip versus the burst effect. Companies have a hard time estimating consumer response to pricing, and they struggle with these two concept, uh, concepts, the threshold and the saturation. So obviously it depends on what kind of product you're selling, but there's often a minimum level of discount below which uh, consumers don't really get excited and sales increase really, really slow, if at all. And that's the threshold. And then there is a level of discount above which sales flatten or 
don't grow as much because there's only so much that people can buy and that's the saturation and when you do promotional pricing in drips uh five percent here ten percent there uh, do you really meet that minimum threshold when you do it in bursts let's say two days off uh two days only 80 percent off uh, do you overdo it and in, in, in that case, you leave money on the table, a lot of money. Now, then there's predictable frequency and execution. That's when you run discounting, when you do discounting so often, that, and in such a predictable way that customers are trained to stock up when stock is on sale, and then wait until it goes back on sales. Now, kind of like, Tied to the previous point, when you offer discounting all the time, your brand is affected. And even if you attract new customers, those customers are much more likely to churn in the future. Finally, you have to uh, pay attention to the product mix, and some companies don't, and you have cannibalization. You should be able, when, when you discount, uh, you should be able to take sales away from your competitors, not from yourself you know, as much as possible. And finally, uh, sometimes price wars are triggered and, and then it gets nasty because at the end, if you all compete on price, what happens is that uh, you only break down the average price that consumers pay uh, for the entire category. So this is why promotional pricing uh, backfires and why you really need to have a clear goal in mind and you need to understand all the pros and cons. Now, there are so many things that we have to consider when we do promotional pricing. Promotional pricing, believe it or not, is really not all about pricing. Now, in a world where everything stays the same, well, then yes, I guess you could just do a simple regression analysis in Excel and get the relationship between price and sales. Uh, but in this world, the one I live in, right, things don't stay the same, do they? So, and I'm not going through each of these points, it would be too long, but there are things you have to take into account, seasonality, uh, the level of advertising to back up your, promotion, your um, discounting or your promotional pricing. Uh, the type of promotion that you run. But if you really want, uh, want to optimize your profit using promotional pricing, you have to take all these and possibly more into account. They have to be incorporated uh, in, into your analysis and accounted for. And that machine learning helps you do exactly that. Now, machine learning needs data. Do we have it? Well, most of the variables that we need for uh, the analysis can be derived uh, directly from transactions or what we call POS data, uh, point of sales data. Uh, but ideally, companies should maintain a promotional database as well. Now, you can see that uh, a promotional database could have something like what kind of promotion was it? How long did it run? What was the discount? Uh, what kind of media was supporting it? Was it not advertised at all, maybe? Uh, if it was a new promotion, what was the closest proxy? Uh, what geographies were excluded, included? Uh, how many stores participated, and so forth. Now, in reality, that doesn't really happen. And the information that's collected is usually little, and it can be as little as the start date and the end date uh, and the product, right? And it usually it sits in some obscure Excel file that uh, marketing analysts have access to. Now, so is it possible, is it still possible to use machine learning to optimize your pricing strategy? And the answer is yes. And I want to show you how we did it using data from a previous project uh, that we did for one of our uh, clients. Now, let me give you a little bit of background. The numbers and scenario are real, but we keep the name confidential, we always do. So let's call this client Jake's Cleaning Supplies. 
So uh, the client wanted to offer a promotional price to boost sales and increase visibility of the industrial strength uh, de uh, degreaser. Now, Jake's is a B2B manufacturer and distributor of industrial clean supplies with sales of 30 million per year, roughly. Uh, they sell through retail, they do not sell directly to consumers, but they sell through retailers and mass merchandisers and they bought three years of POS data <clears throat> on a significant sample of stores. Now, Jake's, uh, Jake's has run promotional pricing in the past, uh, at least in the three years of the observed data, and it's always backed by this, roughly the same level of amount, um, the same amount of TV advertising. So it's always more or less backed by the same uh, advertising strategy. Now, the historical discounts, they ranged from 10% uh, uh, to 50%, and they were either in the form of a, a percentage off the product, or uh, Bogo, uh, Bogo is you buy the first and you get the second one free. Uh, it was okay for us to assume that all stores participated. The uh, manufacturer uh, selling retail, uh, suggested retail price was $34.99, and the cost per unit was 974. Now the cost it, it's okay to assume that the cost is fixed and 974. However, the selling price obviously it varies quite a bit from uh, retailer to retailer. So the key question that they wanted us to answer for them: what is the right amount of discount? And how do we achieve short-term maximum profit and visibility? Uh, while avoiding all the pitfalls that I talked about and that they are very aware of. Now, I pasted uh, here in the, cor in the corner a snapshot of the files that they actually used to track promotions so that you can see what we often have to work with. Uh, in this case, it's just an Excel file. Every tab is a year. Uh, it contains the start date and the end date of the promo the type of the promo, something about the level of advertising, but what it does not contain is uh, how much discount it was given uh, during each campaign, which is kind of funny since uh, all the engagement uh, revolved around discount. Um, also, you notice the discount and TPR, temporary price reduction. In this case, they meant exactly the same thing. So sometimes you can't do everything, everything programmatically, even if you could, uh, you also have to eyeball and understand what the heck is going on and how the data was entered. So how did we, how did we proceed for this specific product and this specific client? So first of all, we needed to derive the discount and how do we do that? Well, because you are selling through retailers, you only have visibility to the actual selling price, not necessarily the regular price, the regular retail price. So what we do is to calculate a baseline price that represents the average price that your customers pay during non-promoted periods. Now, the discount is simply the percentage difference between this price and what the consumers actually paid, so the actual price. Now, notice that if you also have, if you purchase or if you have competitive POS data, you can do the exact same thing for your competitors. So now you can get an estimate of when other brands were being promoted. Now, after that, we need to calculate the, uh, we need to predict what we call baseline sales. So when it, what are baseline sales? That's what sales would have been, what you would expect sales to be without promotions. Uh, now for this task, we used some kind of multivariate algorithm that takes into account all the effects that I was talking about in a previous slide. And that even though I may not be interested in the effects per se, they need to be co controlled for. And some of them were seasonality, holidays, trend, uh, but also the baseline price that we calculated in the previous slide, in the previous slide, in the previous step. So in short, I took into account everything except the discount level. Now, when we do that, 
and then we compare the baseline sales you can see them here predicted in blue with the actual sales now it's very easy to visualize the incremental sales uh, we call them the spikes right that were due only uh, because of promotions so what we did next we took these in in light blue and we charted against uh, the discount uh, that had been offered uh, to see if we could model the relationship between price and consumer demand. So once you chart those sales, so you can see that we once off uh, three times, we had a 10% discount uh, and sales, incremental sales were about uh, in the 1000 range. Uh, when we did 20% uh, one time in the three years of observed data, uh, data and sales were uh, around the 2000 and you can see 30% around four to 6,000 and so forth. What's a little concerning to me is that at 50%, uh, we saw say incremental sales of uh, one time around 12,000 and many times around you know the same incremental sales that you would expect at 10 or 20 percent now how is that possible well the reason is that we did not take into account the first pass did not take into account the type of promotion now a bogo is uh you buy one and get the second one free so it is in a way a 50 percent off However, you can't really treat that one as the regular 50% temporary price reduction on one single item because you first you have to convince the consumer to buy the first item at full price and only then can they get the second one. So treating it as a 50% off is probably not a good idea. So what we did, we ran second step where we removed the effect of the promotion type, which was about a thousand units. And now we recharted the sales, uh, the incremental sales at the all the discount levels. And this is what we got. Now, once you remove that BOGO effect, you can see that there is a relationship as um, the level of discount goes up, you're, you, you sell more, you definitely sell more, your sales go up. Now, what kind of relationship though? It's important to, to understand that uh, the relationship, is it a linear relationship? Well, it's very easy to, to fit, right? We use uh, regular regression analysis, very easy, uh, but you can see that it's easy to interpret, but at 20%, eh, we didn't do a very good job of predicting incremental sales. At 40%, we also under predicted uh, overall, everything else seems fine. However, the problem is that the change in quantity remains constant. So what I mean is that as you keep giving more and more discount, this model will, will keep predicting more and more sales. There's no saturation effect. So in reality, this is a little unrealistic. So what about this one? Perhaps it is really a power function that we should have used. Now you can see that this uh, model does the best job at fitting all the points, the historical points. Uh, it, it's not a very simple model to fit, but, but it does a pretty good job. Now, the problem with this is that uh, it's showing the reverse effect of what we would expect. We know that after a certain point, sales will flatten out, they will start growing at a decreasing rate, just because you, there's only so much you can buy or maybe so much shelf space that you have, right? But in this case, this model, if you were to uh, generalize it to, um, let's say, 60% or 70%, it would keep um, predicting sales uh, at an increasing um, level, let's say. So this is not a good fit either. And using this kind of model can be really costly. So finally, what about some kind of logarithmic model or function? Well, that's great. That's, that's great because it does, uh, it does do a good job at mimicking that saturation that we were talking about. However, of all the other models, 
this is the one that fits the historical data the worst. You can see that 20% we definitely overestimate sales and at uh, 40, 50% we definitely uh, under predict sales. So when you put all of them together, what can you say? You can say the functional relationship that you use in your modeling process, it does affect your results or it can affect your results a lot. And that can mean, and that means you can make some costly mistakes. Now, if you, um, it may not be a huge problem if you use the results, right, to always predict for local estimation. So to predict what you have already seen in the past. But it could be extremely costly if you try and generalize it to uh, new promotions. So let me give you an example. We have never seen a 60% promotion for this product, right? But let's say that you're considering running one. If you use the model that fits the data the best, you would say, look, I can expect 18,000 incremental units. If you use the model that takes into account saturation using the same data, right, you would get 10,000 units which is roughly half. And if that happens to be the true relationship, right, between pricing and how consumers um, respond, then that's a costly mistake. You're gonna lose a lot of money. So how did we approach the process? Well, we used, we didn't use um, any of this to be, to be precise. We used uh, a very custom approach. So what we did, uh, we use gradient descent. I'm sorry, it's, it's, it's a very, it's a buzz term in machine learning. I had to throw it in there. It's really an optimization of, um, algorithm uh, to uh, any nonlinear function that is capable of mirroring both the threshold and the saturation. So if you can see the way this model predicts at very low levels of discounting, sales increase or we predict sales to increase, but not very fast. Then eventually it accelerates, but you can see that as the discount gets deeper and deeper and you run against constraints, which could be the shelf space as well, right? Uh, the model starts, um, the prediction gets flatter and flatter. Now, this is a much more realistic, and you can see that it fits the data really well, and it's a much more realistic um, representation of what's going on in the world. So how did we use this one? Well, once we, we know that we can predict sales at any level of discount, all we have to do is to bring in the price, right? And the cost of running a promotion or the cost of the product. And this is what we do. Uh, now, obviously we do everything using an optimizer, but I put this one in Excel just to give you, uh, to give you an idea of how the process works. Basically what we do, we first calculate incremental sales uh, at any level of discount. So at 5%, it means that from $34, we go to $33 and we expect 500 incremental units. We multiply these two, we get the revenue. We multiply these times the fixed cost of 974 and we get the cost and we get the profit, the expected profit. And we repeat this process and we keep going down until we get to 106,000, which, which is the equivalent of $21, 40% discount. We can see that if we keep going, the next 5% will yield 101,000. So the profit starts coming down. So what we know here is that 40% is really the profit maximizing point for this specific product. So when this client, and they did do it, when they did a 50% in the past, they left money on the table. And that's why they hired us because probably they didn't want to do it again. So what this tells us is that in conclusion, right, uh, there are so many things that you have to take into account and you can't just say, uh, oh, well, I'm just going to take the price and I'm going to take the, the sales and see what happens. There are so many effects you have to take into account and uh, you have to have an ex expert consultant, um, you know, tell you if uh, the methodology you're using, if it's a good fit for your specific case. So what have we learned? Well, before engaging in promotional pricing, really ask yourself, 
what your goal is. Uh, remember, it's, it, it should be a firm term goal, uh, or else it can and it will backfire in the long term. Uh, do you have the data that you need? Uh, the data availability drives the final project. So you have to have a goal in mind, but the, the project or the scope is really driven by the amount of data that you can access. And then remember, promotional pricing is not just about pricing. In fact, I think pricing is the easy part. Controlling for everything else is the hard part. And do you have internally the skill set that you need? So after all this, do you still think promotional pricing is the right strategy for you? And if you do, I would be more than happy to review your data and give you a completely free assessment of uh, what kind of data you have, uh, if given the data, if you can uh, reach your goal, if promotional pricing is good for you, and um, or if you could do it internally with our help, or if we should maybe outsource it. So um, if you have any questions about anything we discussed today, please feel free to send me an email and I will be more than happy to reach out to you and answer all the questions you have. Now, for now, I just wanted to thank you very much for the attention and I hope to see you, um, I hope you'll attend my next webinar. Thank you very much, stay safe.